This is a revision video for the biological approach to treating OCD. And the first thing I want you to do is quickly sketch the OCD cycle. So at the top, you've got obsessions, and you know that means that someone will have intrusive thoughts that they obsess about, and that will lead to the next stage of anxiety. And when we say anxiety, we mean overwhelming, such intense anxiety about their intrusive thought and their obsession about it, that the anxiety will lead to the compulsion, which means that someone will feel compelled to perform a behaviour that will relieve their anxiety about their obsession. So very common compulsions are things like excessive hand washing or lock checking. And then when the person with OCD has performed that behaviour enough times for them, then they will feel relief. However, it is a cycle. And so unfortunately, the intrusive thoughts will recur. And what we're looking at is how do we treat that? How do we break that OCD cycle? How do we help people with OCD not to feel controlled by their obsessions and their anxiety and their compulsions um, and so that they can live a much freer life where they don't have to um, have all the worry, anxiety and the behaviours? And so we're looking at the biological approach and the biological approach assumes that someone has got OCD because of biological reasons, such as maybe they've inherited a genetic vulnerability for OCD. Um, so what we're looking at is if the OCD has a biological cause, then we are going to treat that according to the biological approach in a in a biological way. And so we're going to use drug therapy. And in this video, we're going to look at different types of drugs that treat OCD. And the first type of drugs are called antidepressants. And you might be thinking, but antidepressants are used for depression. And they are. However, they can also be very useful as a treatment for people with OCD. So the first antidepressant we'll look at are called SSRIs. And that stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And I'll just say that again because it's, it will help you understand how they work if you understand the wording of what SSRI stands for. So it's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And we'll look at how that works in a moment. But we, what we know from the biological explanation is that people with OCD tend to have low levels of serotonin. And antidepressants work by increasing the levels of serotonin at the synapse, which should break the, the worry circuit, which should normalize their worry circuit in their brain. And that will make them feel um, calmer. And so they won't feel compelled to do their compulsion. So if we just drill down into that a little bit more, we need to know about synaptic transmission, which I'm sure you do from biopsychology. So what happens with um, SSRIs is that when the nerve impulse has um, it stimulated the vesicles to diffuse the, the neurotransmitter serotonin into the synapse. And then the receptors have got hold of it and that has an inhibitory effect on the next neuron. What we're thinking is, well, these people haven't got enough serotonin and so therefore the receptor sites are not getting enough. And that means the inhibitory calming effect isn't felt by the person. And so the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors work by blocking the reuptake of serotonin back into the presynaptic neuron, which will then be go back in the vesicle, vesicles, ready to be recycled. So if it's blocking the reuptake, we're gonna end up with ser more serotonin in the synapse for longer. So it's not that SSRIs increase how much serotonin you make, it's that it, it works on the mechanism of reuptake by blocking that so that the re receptors have more chance of um, binding with that serotonin and so therefore they've got more chance of having that inhibitory response. Now if you're one of my students you'll be thinking hopefully about your serotonin hat and that's where when you put your serotonin hat on you have a calm mood and a balanced mind and I hope you're doing the actions. Um, and so you can see that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors work by increasing the serotonin so you, therefore you have more chance of having a calm mood and a balanced mind and when you look at the OCD cycle that hopefully you drew earlier it just takes the anxiety out of the cycle so even if someone does have intrusive thoughts they are not going to feel anxious about them and therefore they won't feel compelled to perform their behavior or do the compulsion and that's how SSRIs work. SSRIs are not always effective in some people and what if a 
a medical professional found that they hadn't been successful, they might then treat uh, prescribed tricyclics. These are also an antidepressant and they work in the same way as SSRIs, but instead of just targeting or you know, selecting serotonin, they are going to select serotonin and noradrenaline at the synapse. They're going to block the reuptake of both of those neurotransmitters, which should have um, a more inhibitory effect. However, you might be thinking, well, why don't they just prescribe those straight away? And the problem is that um, tricyclics, uh, SNRIs, they have more side effects. And so first of all, someone will be treated with SSRIs. And if they don't work, then they might try the SNRIs, the um, tricyclics, which target both serotonin and noradrenaline um, to see if that will help. And so antidepressants can be used as a long term solution for OCD. A short term solution for OCD uses um, could use a drug called um, a, a range of drugs called benzodiazepines. And you may have heard of some of the benzodiazepines like Valium or Tamazepam, Diazepam, all of them are benzodiazepines. And so we're going to look at how they work to treat OCD. So I have a look at this incredible diagram that I drew. Uh, the reason I drew this is because I couldn't find a suitable free image of, uh, of this, how GABA, the neurotransmitter GABA works. So I had to draw my own. Um, <laughs> what an artist. So first of all we need to understand how GABA works because before we look at the drug benzodiazepine GABA is a neurotransmitter and it is the body's natural form of anxiety relief so it works by um, the nerve impulse comes shooting down the axon to the post presynaptic neuron and it stimulates the vesicles to to diffuse GABA into the synapse or synaptic cleft or synaptic gap the receptors uh, on the postsynaptic neuron, they bind with the GABA or they react with the GABA and that will increase the flow of chloride ions into the next neuron, into the postsynaptic neuron. And that has a very strong inhibitory response, which means that we're going to feel extremely calm. And so it's the body's natural form of anxiety relief. Isn't the body amazing? And the brain. So that's how GABA works and benzodiazepines work. Hold on to your hats for the next great diagram. GABA, if you look at all the bits in kind of a pinky colour there, uh, benzodiazepines work by binding to the, the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. So if you can see on the left, there's some little like pink, what look like semicircles, that's your benzodiazepine drug. When you take the drug, they come swooping in and then they bind to the receptors. And so that will increase the flow of chloride ions into the next channel, and that enhances the inhibitory effect, which mean, might mean the next nerve impulse doesn't fire at all. So benzodiazepines are working to enhance the natural GABA effect, and I kind of think of them as like a booster. Your body's going, right, I'm going to try and deal with the anxiety that someone's feeling, and benzodiazepines give it a big boost and a helping hand. It will increase the flow of chloride ions into the next neuron, increasing that inhibitory response. And if you're wondering why I drew that by hand, then um, this was my attempt at not drawing it by hand. So you can see why. Um, so benzodiazepines, as I said, are a short term measure. So we're going to. So those are the drugs we've looked at. Antidepressants. And I'd first of all, just concentrate on SSRIs. And if you've got a big question about it, you might then explain that if they're not effective, you can use the SNRIs. And then for a short term measure, you can use benzodiazepines, which are incredibly calming and effective. And again, just take out the anxiety from the OCD cycle. So the evaluation points, the first one is looking at the effectiveness of drug therapy. And we're going to look first of all at the effectiveness of SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors in treating OCD. And any drug that people take that is licensed will have um, been through extensive drug trials where they compare the real drug to a placebo to check that the drug is working and it isn't just the person's mind that is um, having a strong effect and, and causing the relief of symptoms. So in a meta-analysis comparing SSRIs to placebos, uh, there were 17 studies on OCD patients and Sumuro, 
found that they were more effective than placebos in reducing the symptoms of OCD for up to three months. So this is a strength of SSRIs in treating OCD, and it seems that they, they are effective and that they do work. A really easy evaluation point is that SSRIs taking drug therapy is really cheap and easy. So drug therapy is easy for patients. All you have to do is remember to take a pill. And that is in contrast to psychological methods where you have to give up incredible amount of time, effort, money, motivation that is required for things like cognitive behavioral therapy. So it is a much cheaper option than talking therapy. And that takes either financial pressure off the NHS if you had gone through that method in the UK, or if the individual is paying for it themselves, then it is a much cheaper option. So the next evaluation is a kind of strength and a limitation, and it's talking about benzodiazepines. So benzodiazepines are an extremely effective short-term solution for OCD, but at a cost. So benzodiazepines are very, very effective, and um, I've taken them once when I had some wisdom teeth out because I'm pretty, I just don't like the dentist really, and I just didn't fancy it. And I thought, I just can't get through it. And the dentist suggested benzo like taking a, a mild benzodiazepine to get through that process. So I know how effective they are. And they are, um, I felt like I was in a bit of a bubble. I went along to the dentist. I, was, I wasn't very like um, polite to anybody. I just kind of went through the motions, but it helped me get through that incredibly stressful event. It's, I didn't take them because I have OCD. But imagine if someone with OCD had a really, really stressful event to go through, like having their wisdom teeth out or perhaps something like a long haul flight, which would trigger overwhelming symptoms for them. Then benzodiazepines are an excellent option for those people because they are so effective. However, they do come at a cost. So they I've put there they're almost too effective. And that's so when I took them, as I said, I, I wasn't very polite, didn't really feel like myself. I felt like I was in a bit of a bubble. I didn't feel like I was in the real world. And and so people who take um, people who take benzodiazepines, they might not care about anything um, that could actually affect their functioning in society. They might not become like a very good employee or they might not be a good parent or um, student or something and so they're so effective at taking out the anxiety that actually um, that effect they have could inhibit their normal day-to-day -day life. The other big problem with benzodiazepines, although they're an amazing short-term solution, they are not a good long-term solution. Um, not only for the reasons I just said, but because they are highly physically addictive with really serious withdrawal symptoms, which even include death. And so um, Ashton, who's a bit of a whiz on benzodiazepines, recommends that they shouldn't be taken for more than four weeks um, at all uh, because of their highly addictive nature. The other problem with all drug therapy, so this is for benzodiazepines and antidepressants, is, and in any drug really, all drugs have side effects and sometimes the side effects can be so unpleasant that people don't want to use the drug at all. So even though a drug might be incredibly effective, if the side effects are so intense that you can't take them, then it's not an effective treatment because you're not going to be treated with it. So it's good to, you don't have to know loads and loads of side effects, but um, there's some side effects for SSRIs, the SNRIs and the benzodiazepines there. Um, SNRIs, particularly have horrible side effects like hallucinations um, and heart irregularities, but all drugs have side effects and that is um, a limitation of all drug therapy. And another evaluation is something called publication bias. So you should know about peer review and that when, um, so when somebody publishes their research, so, for example, if they did research that meta-analysis we looked at on the effectiveness of um, SSRIs, that would have gone through peer review, which means it would have got sent off to experts in the field who will scrutinise the research and decide whether it will get published. But we've got a problem here because there's something called publication bias. So research has found that positive outcomes are much more likely to be published, which exaggerates their effectiveness. If the researchers are only um, publishing the, the 
studies that show that drug therapy is effective, then all of the studies are going to say, oh, look, they're really effective, but they tend not to publish studies that show that they haven't been effective. And so that doesn't really give us a balanced view. The other problem is that drug companies fund a lot of the research about the effectiveness of medication and have a financial interest in their continued use. And I've got a really old picture there of the drugs company called Eli Lilly and Co Chemists. Um, that drug company um, still makes Prozac, which is an SSRI. Um, by the way, I googled that yesterday. So if it's wrong, I'm really sorry and don't ever quote that. But that's what I found out yesterday. But basically, drug companies who are make, making these drugs to treat OCD have got a financial interest. And if they're funding the research and then the research that gets published shows if it has that publication bias, then we may be getting an over exaggerated idea of how effective drug therapy is for treating OCD. You could um, contrast the biological method of treatment with the psycho, um, a behaviourist treatment for OCD, which is um, basically where people are conditioned to try and help them with it um, if, you, if you felt like you needed an extra evaluation point. So that point is actually explained in more detail on the previous video. So you've had the content. I've refreshed your memory on the content. And hopefully as you were watching it, you were like, yep, I know this. This is uh, I know all about this and I feel much more confident. But you need to make it stick. And so you need to do an activity that is going to really help you consolidate your knowledge. I recommend really stretching yourself and trying a timed essay. So whenever you do a timed essay, then you will write the essay first and edit it and get it as succinctly written as possible, with it, but with as much detail. And then you need to practice writing it in 20 minutes because that's about how long you would get in the exam. So you could try this timed essay with a stimulus. It says that Fatima has been awarded a scholarship to study in Canada for the second year of her degree. She has OCD and is worried about coping with her symptoms on the flight to Canada and living in another country. Her friend mentioned that medication might help. Discuss the biological treatment of OCD. Refer to suitable medication for Fatima in your answer, 16 marks. So when you get a, um, a 16 marker with a stimulus, then you need to make sure that you discuss it, um, which sounds obvious, but the word discuss means outline and evaluate. And then you're going to ref, um, refer to Fatima as well. And what a lot of people do is they just think, oh, look, I can dive straight in. I know what's going on. Fatima needs to take benzodiazepines for the flight. and She needs to take SSRIs for living in Canada to cope with symptoms. But hold your horses. First of all, you need to outline the drug therapy. So six marks to, of AO1, the description, so you would outline the basic assumption, and then I would probably um, outline about SSRIs and benzodiazepines. Um, I probably wouldn't bother with the SNRIs at this point. If you've got a different question, then you might want to put that in as well, but I just don't think you'd have time. Then you're gonna apply that knowledge to Fatima. So you're gonna have two paragraphs about Fatima and uh, the drug therapy that might work for her on the flight and living in Canada. And so that's your AO2 material. And then you need to have six marks for evaluation. So I would recommend three evaluation paragraphs because you get roughly two marks per evaluation. So one strength, one limitation and something else. Or the examiners talk about the depth, breadth, trade-off. And that's where you can talk about maybe two evaluation points in a lot more detail or three evaluation points maybe in less detail. And that will make sure that you've covered everything that you need. The To get in the top level, um, the training courses I've been on, the examiners talk about like being able to weave all of the AO1, AO2 and AO3 together. If you're confident and competent and able to do that, then have a go. But if you're not, I would just really stick to that format of outline the therapy apply it to Fatima in this case, and then evaluate the theory. Um, you could try some other direct uh, revision activities with these questions here. So you could pause the video and have a look at those. And those are your picture references.